Hey, yo, listen up. The following podcast may feature spoilers for the movie Demolition Man. And if you ain't seen it, go see it. Welcome to Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect film's most dastardly schemes, then try to improve them. I'm your host, Ben Steinson, and this week's movie is Demolition Man. So finish off your rat burger and let's get diabolical. Today I'm joined by our panel of peril. Introduce yourselves and tell us what's your favourite Sylvester Stallone movie. I'm Adam Turner and my favourite Sylvester Stallone movie is Tango Ad Cash. I'm Craig Morris, and my favourite Sylvester Stallone movie is, well, it's Rocky, isn't it? Because it's the godfather of underdog sports movies, of which I'm a huge fan. And I'm Gaz Slade, and my favourite Stallone movie is Copland, because it's the most worthy, and I am a very pretentious film fan. That is true, both (laughs) of those things. (laughs) Later, they'll be competing for the title of this week's Most Diabolical. But first, let's take a closer look at this week's movie. Released in 1993, Demolition Man was Marco Brambilla's directorial debut. His other listed film credits include 1997's Excess Baggage, starring Alicia Silverstone, Benicio Del Toro and Christopher Walken, and the 2010 music video for Kanye West's Power. He is also a prominent visual artist. The film proved to be something of a comeback film for star Sylvester Stallone, following a costly series of flops. It grossed $159 million worldwide. 1993 was a stellar year for cinema, with films such as Schindler's List, The Fugitive, Dazed and Confused, and Groundhog Day released. Elsewhere, Bill Clinton was sworn in as President of the United States. Tennis player Monica Sellers was stabbed by a member of the crowd during a match in Hamburg. And ID Software's landmark video game Doom was released. Demolition Man is set in 2032 in the seemingly peaceful utopia of San Angeles. John Spartan, a police officer with a reputation for collateral damage, is released from his cryogenic prison to pursue Simon Phoenix, a violent career criminal from the past who is running amok. As the film progresses, we discover that Phoenix's release was all part of self-styled saviour of San Angeles, Dr. Raymond Cocteau's evil plan to assassinate the leader of a resistance group who live in the underground ruins of Los Angeles and refuse to conform to Cocteau's moral ideals. So, what did you think of the movie? I thought it was okay to boring. (laughs) <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it got my hopes up really quickly because the uh, present day 1996 section reminded me of Terminator 2. The uh, mm. future sequences there, the way it's lit, yeah, um, the explosion of the whatever the hell that place is meant that to be, building, disused yeah. warehouse. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good first explosion, though, isn't it? So yeah, it's massive. They used a real building and real explosives for that. They, mm. they it was being demolished, and they yeah. they did a, a proper number on it. It's interesting. You said it remind you of Terminator because what it reminded me of was Predator Two. Okay, how obviously the movies of that era heavily influenced by the LA riots mm. and every even a few years into the future, near future glimpses of LA were always these bleak hellscapes so that's that's a, what it made me think of right away adam yeah I, i'd uh, concur about the the terminator thing that's exactly what i was thinking when i watched it as well i was like this is very terminator-esque so uh yeah but um, the, th- the three things i immediately sort of took from it uh it's pretty you know th- after three three years it's only set three years from when it was made and all of a sudden this it's Los Angeles has turned into like a violent war zone and and it's craziness. But oh no, we we just alluded to what was going on at the time and stuff. I think there was a real fear at the time that the LA riots would would turn LA into a, yeah. a war zone. But also, um, you know, gang gang violence and it's funny because what what um, struck me about it, like you say, it's only three four years in the in the future of when it was actually made. But they have imagined that in that short time. Not only will 
cryogenic freezing of adult humans become viable, but also that scientists will start wearing quasi-futuristic clothes and that the uh, everybody will dress in those like clear plastic <laughs> smocks when they're when they're being frozen. What did you think of the effects? I thought they'd uh, they held up very well. If, the, if there'd have been a lot of early CG, I think the film would have dated a lot more. Yeah, the the um, the cars are great. The um, they were GM concept cars, but they all look really good. They're believably future tech. They could still be conceivable now. I think uh, the city in the future looks really good. I know a lot of that is um, matte paintings, but it holds up really well. I think uh, there's some optical effects later on. Like um, Phoenix gets a energy weapon of some kind, and the optical effects don't hold up great. And there's some effects towards the end of the film, particularly um, the explosion at the end, <laughs> which is very clearly, uh, you know, like a, what do they call those effects? Like a, not an in camera, but you know, where they uh, they lay like a, an element over. It might be called an overlay, but there's a there's a really weak looking explosion like at the end, at the very end. Can I share my favourite line of dialogue? Oh, God, you've got to... I reckon we're all going to have the same one on this. Go on. Do you think? Okay. Yes. It's <laughs> fucking amazing. <laughs> so my favourite line of dialogue is uh, when... Uh, is it called Cocteau? Sir Nigel Hawthorne's yeah. character. When yeah. Cocteau and uh, Stallone are having some sort of confrontation and Cocteau says to Stallone, be well, and Stallone says, be fucked. <laughs> I thought it was uh, Oscar Wildean wit. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'd yeah. be willing to say that wasn't written in the script, but ad lib. <laughs> yeah. Yo, Adrian. Yeah, I guess this is you. Be fucked, you. You. That's the wrong film. That's Rocky. <laughs> if you watch the wrong film, my, my comedy is wasted on you. You've watched the wrong film, haven't you? <laughs> this is going to... Oh. I'll tell you my favourite line of dialogue, and it's one of many delivered by what is my favourite performance, I think, in the movie, and there's a few to choose from, but I just think Sandra Bullock's great. And uh, when she makes a mess of little 20th century phrases, and one of them is, looks like there's a new shepherd in town, and she means sheriff. Uh, and also, um, again, this is not a full line, but... When he was uh, telling Sandra Bullock, uh, Huxley, when he was telling Huxley about uh, what sex was like in the past, uh, one of the terms he uses to describe the act of coitus is the hunker chunker. <laughs> 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 Which is not one that I'm familiar with. I've, I've never heard that one before. He says, boning, the wild mumbo, the hunker yeah. chunker. <laughs> the hunker chunker. <laughs> And obviously, um, never, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard that outside that film. Every action movie needs a good sort of uh, a badass uh, line, and I think this is quite early on. He says uh, to himself, "Send a maniac to catch one," <laughs> which I thought could have been the tagline for the film. Yeah, it does. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you you'd both picked this other one that I picked up on straight away, and uh, where he's fighting the the scraps outside the Taco Bell. And he just turns to Warren and goes, you're going to regret this the rest of your life. Both seconds of them. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I've got a couple of favorite lines. There's one where uh, Simon Phoenix has escaped the prison. Uh, he goes to use the uh, the kind of ca the camera phone that's on the street there. Mm. And uh, the police surround him and they, they tell him to, you know, to give up. And... Uh, I forget what his what his line is, but he says something. He says something back to the police, and the policeman speaks in into his uh, computer assistant. Says, uh, "The maniac has responded with a scornful remark." <laughs> <laughs> it's good, all that section. Yeah, Rob Schneider's is very funny in that bit. And then uh, in the museum, when Sam Phoenix is uh, thinking how to get through the glass, he kicks it and he punches it, and he can't get through it. And then someone comes along and says, uh, "Fellow, greetings, sir. What seems to be your boggle?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good that. I love that. And then my final favourite one. Remember those 40 passengers? They were already dead. Cold as Hagendars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all very good. What did you think of the, the world building in the movie? The costume building was uh, <laughs> interesting. Particularly, I think Wesley Snipes has the worst wardrobe in any sort of film ever. 
He starts <laughs> off the film with like stripy MC hammer pants. Then when he escapes yeah. from prison, he's got dungarees on. And then for some reason, he fashions himself a, a vest out of tires. So I was just like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> But uh, yeah, but everybody else seems to get away with just wearing pajamas and robes and stuff, and that's about it. I think that's probably a byproduct of the COVID era, right? Everybody gets used to wearing their pajamas. Everyone's working from home. Eventually, all clothes have become pajamas. It's funny you should mention the COVID era because there were quite a few moments in the film where I felt it was it was almost kind of prophetic. Mm-hmm. They talked about uh, obviously sex be replaced by those headsets because of uh outbreaks and uh, and uh pandemics they even mentioned the uh the Arnold Schwarzenegger memorial library i, I know he yeah. didn't go to become president but he uh he did become a, a governor yeah you can even make an argument um that it predicted toilet paper shortages because they're using the shells instead of toilet yeah. yeah exactly yeah um and they uh they do the high five <laughs> when they don't touch mm. and when uh when he high fives the guy in the police precinct, he's uh, he's going germ, germ. Were you surprised by any of the casting? Were there any pleasant surprises? Anyone you you forgot that was in there, or anyone you noticed that you didn't recognise first time round, perhaps? I forgot Nigel Hawthorne was in it. Obviously, we probably know him best from Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, so that was a nice surprise. I didn't remember and didn't notice until later on actually that Jack Black was in it. He's one yeah. of the uh, resistance fighters i i noticed after the credits and, and went back yeah to <laughs> yeah i think jesse ventura was one of phoenix's goons he didn't even get a line i couldn't believe no. it yeah it was, it was weird it, because he didn't speak at first i wasn't sure if it was um goldberg but then i was like no that's definitely jesse ventura he's got his name on its own i think in the opening credits as well he doesn't even get a line of dialogue maybe it was all cut yeah true maybe he he said slack-jawed faggots again. To me, like, no, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> Goddamn sexual Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> you probably, would he, he'd probably get one, one credit fine for that. That's about it. The person I forgot was in it was actually Sandra Bullock. I don't remember her being in it at all. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I remembered, obviously, Sloane Snipes, Nigel Hawthorne, Rob Schneider. And See, I didn't it. remember Schneider. I didn't. <laughs> I knew he was in Judge Dredd, but mm. didn't yeah didn't remember he was in Demolition Man. Yeah, he popped up and I was instantly nonplussed. <laughs> Sandra Bullock is the main reason that I enjoyed any of this because she's just perfect in it. Like she, she, uh, she plays that role so well, and like yeah. having seen her in other things, I know mm. that she's not like a one trick pony there. So yeah, mm. I think she brought a lot of uh, character and uh, heart to the to the whole thing. She was really good. One piece of casting I thought was a real waste was uh, Bill Cobbs, who's uh, that old, really old black guy who was like, he was around when Spartan was around previously. He's the only one who remembers him. He's amazing and he doesn't get much to do. Like he's uh, such a characterful actor and he gets like three lines. And it would have been really interesting to see the dynamic between them, him being one of the only people who was around, you know, for, for the first Demolition Man show. But they just sort of wasted that, I thought. I thought I thought that, that whole element of it was weird. I mean, they're clearly people who are alive when yeah, he was frozen. Just who have who well forgot, adapted to... <laughs> yeah, any concept that John Spartan talks <laughs> of, he's they're like, what What do you mean? What are these alien concepts you, you talk of? Yeah, they should have done it like 130 years into the yeah, future. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. You can excuse it. Yeah. I suppose the difference between the 60s and the 90s was so palpable that maybe that made sense then but not much has changed in our generation or it doesn't feel like it has anyway yeah yeah. but each decade of the the 20th century is so distinct and it has its own look and feel that hasn't really happened in the 21st century maybe it, it will with the context of history but it has just felt like fashion hasn't really moved on massively since then Although I've got to admit, I am wearing more kimonos now than I was in 1993. I'm not. I think that might, there may be a different reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> Should you explain that for the listener? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll let them puzzle it out. <laughs> yeah. What did we think of Cocteau's scheme? It seems a bit over the top. I think it's the kind of the definition of overkill. 
He's he's doing exactly what we were talking about just earlier. He's fighting fire with fire. He wants to get rid of a bunch of what he perceives to be criminals who who can't who don't buy into his sort of uh, ideological uh, view of the world and and how it should be run. So he's going well to do that. I'll just get an even bigger criminal who who killed loads and loads of people and just and doesn't want to live in the way they see fit, and then things will go fine. Yeah. My thing with Coxo's plan is just in terms of narrative it was it was played as though it was kind of a reveal that he brought wesley snipes and it to me it was obvious from the beginning that that's what had happened it was like a big oh this is what he's done i was like well i know that. yeah <laughs> the twist was when snipes just shoots him and they chuck him yeah, in the fucking fireplace and it's really obviously a dummy as well yeah. with the legs sticking up <laughs> Angle. Snipes doesn't shoot him though, does he? He gets one of his henchies. Oh to, yeah, uh, you're right. Yeah, he's got that that um, inhibitor yeah. in him, hasn't he? Did anyone else think that uh, Cocteau may have come up with this diabolical scheme, but perhaps to, forgot to uh, to come up with a, a fail safe? Yeah, he didn't seem to have any any a way out. Yeah, definitely. He's, he especially when uh, Snipes says to him, uh, well, sorry, um, Phoenix says to him, uh, oh yeah, all I need is loads <laughs> more bad guys defrosted. That I haven't got anything to so. from killing you. That'll be fine, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sound, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the real reason that it was telegraphed um, is that there's a voice that speaks to uh, Phoenix soon after he is awakened. It's very clearly Nigel Hawthorne's voice. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's maybe That's the it. only Brit in the movie that I can recall. <laughs> Do you hear it? That voice in your head? That's Nigel Hawthorne. Spared no expense. <laughs> this is the part of the show where our panel of peril compete for the title of this week's Most Diabolical and with it the honour of choosing next week's movie and hosting the show. Dr. Raymond Cocteau's plan was to use a dangerous criminal in order to assassinate the leader of a resistance group who refused to conform to his moral ideals. But he was unsuccessful. Craig, what would you have done differently? Well, the inspiration for my version of Cocteau's plan is slightly based around the casting of uh, Nigel Hawthorne. When I grew up, I knew him best uh, for Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. And uh, he has, what it seemed to me, kind of a, a similar MO in that he's the real guy in power. He's the one pulling the strings, but he uses this feckless MP as his kind of, uh, his proxy, his uh, his dummy. So it felt to me like Cocteau, naive as he is, he's quite an older character in it. He would have been around, uh, presumably, when Spartan was... Uh, still kicking so it seemed to me that he should know better than to use a, a dangerous career criminal uh who's clearly a loose cannon like simon phoenix um in his in his scheme so assuming i have the same resources at hand as cocteau rather than looking to the cryo prison for a place to choose uh the the instrument of uh my action uh, i'd look to somebody more easily manipulated uh, and I think there's an obvious character in the movie who fits the bill there, and it's Lenina Huxley. So I think <laughs> what I would do is uh, she's handily quite lippy. She's not afraid to give her bosses some shit under her breath. So I'd have her arrested as a sort of example. Just put her in cryo for the night and show her what it's like. That would be the pretense. And while she's in cryo, I'd give her all the training to be an efficient killer and a lot of subliminal messaging about how Edgar Friendly is a threat. And then I'd send her out. But here's where I think my plan really comes into its own. Instead of having anyone, let alone a, a dangerous psychopath like Phoenix, kill uh, Edgar Friendly, I wouldn't want to make a martyr of him. So instead, I'd have Huxley arrest Edgar Friendly, put him in cryo, retrain him as a police officer, then send them both back out after the next, probably the rat burger lady, and send them to arrest her, put her in cryo, retrain her as a police officer, and then every time I've got one extra police officer that I've trained, I send them back out to arrest everybody from the underground until eventually I've got an army of perfectly trained police officers at my command. 
And what's your time scale? Are we talking Goldfinger 15 years? It's exponential, right? So I'm putting Huxley under the ice for one night and I'm giving her the Matrix upload training of, you know, Kung Fu and, you know, arrest techniques and all that kind of thing. She goes out the next day. She probably arrests friendly the next day. Day two go out the following day. I think after about a week, there's enough officers to probably arrest the whole pitiful wheat scraps remaining. So I'm thinking about a fortnight, and then my utopian society is uh, perfect as I want it to be. Not bad time scale. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Turner, what would you have done differently? Well, I have. I came up with two plans. One's a bit more long-winded, and the other's just three words. Let's go with the three words one, because... <laughs> <laughs> well, the three-word one is poison rat burgers. <laughs> I like it. Because <laughs> I initially just I just thought, right, what's the first thing that comes into my head? And I just thought, oh, they're all... They're all down there. They're all eating rat burgers and stuff. And that's the easiest way to get rid of them. Just uh, sort of get a load of rats and put something into them that doesn't kill them immediately. But then once they've been uh, farmed for their for their plentiful supplies of meat, inhabitants of the subterranean world will happily devour them without too many questions. Gaz, what have you got for us? My plan revolves around something that Craig alluded to earlier. I think we're all aware that the leader of the scraps is played by Dennis Leary. Leary, if you're unaware, started his showbiz career as an anti-authority comedian who would go off on rants about the unseemly underbelly of the American dream, crass commercialisation, objectification and so on. Most people will also be aware that he pilfered most of his shtick and some line-for-line verbiage from the legendary Bill Hicks, the chain-smoking iconoclast dressed in black like Johnny Cash and calling out iniquity and double standards inherent in society, both at home in the US and abroad. Indeed, when Hicks surprised many by quitting smoking, he was asked why he did so. He simply replied to see if Dennis would too. Bearing this in mind, if I were Sir Nigel Hawthorne, when I was establishing my authoritarian regime of St. Angeles, I would find Hicks. I would suggest him another experiment wherein he would pledge his undying fealty to the state. This would go directly against the free-thinking principles that Hicks lived his life by, and therefore would be an extremely effective experiment in seeing whether Dennis would too. Would the leader of the scraps, Dennis Leary, follow the lead of Hicks and become compliant with an authoritarian leadership because his friend slash mentor slash ideas man had first? Without Leary at the helm, the scraps would not be able to mobilise against Hawthorne, eliminating the need to unfreeze Wesley Snipes, Sylvester Stallone, and ensuring the survival and growth of San Angeles forever. Forever! <laughs> <laughs> They're so close to one of my first ideas, which was to unfreeze Bill Hicks and just tell him, just kill Dennis Leary. Gaz, um, did you mistake the character Dennis Leary was playing for Dennis Leary? <laughs> it's a documentary, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. Uh, he does a Dennis Leary style rant outside Taco Bell. So yes, my, my take yeah. was he's playing himself. Therefore, I thought it was fair game to bring the deceased, he died that year, Bill Hicks, into the universe. <laughs> he died in 94. Oh, oh was it? Oh, okay, yeah, year yeah. after then. Okay. So well, he was still alive. He was yeah, probably really quite ill. Ill. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he watched Demolition Man? Bill Hicks? For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I imagine it was his dying wish. <laughs> I just want to see Demolition Man <laughs> in my hospital bed <laughs> from my iron lung. <laughs> okay, some absolutely diabolical schemes there, but there can be only one winner. This week's most diabolical and host of next week's show is Dr. Craig Morris. Right. I think his two-week plan it was realistic. <laughs> he went for the low-hanging fruit in uh, Lenina Huxley. And most importantly, did not confuse mm -hmm. real-world actors or characters <laughs> in the movie. So... Fish posh. <laughs> I, I think that's but, unfair. But Adam, you were a close second with your three-worder. <laughs> that was excellent. That really impressed oh. me. Brevity. Oh, yeah. Brevity. No, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy with second place. <laughs> So, uh, what movie have you chosen for us? When We Meet Again, 
to discuss a diabolical villain plot. The movie we'll be talking about is Ace Ventura Pet Detective. <laughs> oh, 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 that's a spicy meatball. Oh, and that is the juicy. first Ace Ventura movie, not the second one, mind you. Ace Ventura Pet Detective. Yeah. 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 I'm slightly nervous to see if that has aged well or not. It hasn't. <laughs> oh, you've ruined it. What's the point? No, no right, it hasn't gone. I'm, I'm going to no. take a week off, so you, you three can talk. <laughs> That's all for this week. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at DiabolicalPod. Join us next week, where we'll be diving into the murky world of Ace Ventura Pet Detective.